Okay, uh, we are going to continue our discussion of conservation of linear momentum. This time, the example we're going to look at is one which involves a ball. And of course, certain things happen to this ball. Um, now, the question is, is this a linear momentum problem? That's the other thing I found out. Uh, no, this is not a... This is an impulse problem, so we're going to skip example number three. It's an impulse problem. Uh, we have to look for something which looks like conservation. Okay. Yeah, so we're going to move to example number five. And so we have to admit someone, unfortunately. So a 40 ton freight car, so basically this is a train car, these are train cars costing at a speed of five meters per second along a straight track when it strikes a 300, sorry, a 30,000 kg stationary freight car and couples to it. What will be the combined speed after impact? So again, uh, when we are talking about these collision things we assume a couple of things uh just to remind you one the first thing we assume is that these objects which are colliding are moving at constant speed or constant velocity so there is no force which is causing these particular objects to increase their velocity or to reduce their velocity okay the other thing apart from the absence of an external force and we know that an external force causes the velocity of an object to change Apart from the absence of an external force, the other thing to note is that this conservation of linear momentum, when it comes to collision, it only works just before the collision happens and just after the collision happens. Okay, just before collision and just after collision. So in this case, we have the car, a first car, which is 40,000 uh, 40, kgs, moving at a constant, at a speed of five meters per second. So this op speed doesn't change. We have another car which is 30 kgs, uh, 30,000 uh, 30, kgs, and it's stationary. So its speed is basically zero meters per second, or its velocity is zero meters per second since it's stationary. The first car is what we are denoting as M1 here. M1 is 40,000 kgs. The velocity of the first car, which is the velocity of the first car before impact, that's what we're denoting as U1. U1 is five meters per second. Then the second car, which is stationary, this second car we are denoting as M2, which is 30,000 kgs. The velocity of the second car is what we are denoting as U2, which is 0 meters per second. Why it's 0 meters per second is because this car is stationary. Then, before this collision happens, before impact, we can find out what is the total linear momentum. Basically, Total linear, mo linear momentum, as we have seen before, linear momentum is a measure of how much motion is happening. So what is the total motion which is happening before impact? That's what is referred to as linear momentum. A measure of the amount of motion which objects are undergoing is linear momentum. And how do we get linear momentum? We obtain linear momentum by multiplying the mass of this particular object times its velocity. So mass times velocity. So in our case here, before this event, which is the impact, before they collide, we want to find out what is the total linear momentum. The total linear momentum is going to be the mass of the first car multiplied by the velocity of the first car before impact, plus the mass of the second car multiplied by the velocity of the second car before impact. This is the total linear momentum. So that is going to be 40,000 kgs multiplied by the velocity of the first car before impact, which is five meters per second, plus 30,000 uh, 30, kgs, which is the mass of the second car, multiplied by its velocity, which is this one, and we end up having a total amount of linear momentum, M1, U1, plus M2, U2, which is equal to 200,000 kgs meters per second. Where am I too fast? We are trying to work out what the total linear momentum is before these train cars collide and just after they collide. So before they collide, we need to find out what is the total amount of motion. The total amount of motion is measured using linear momentum. So we need to find out the total linear momentum before impact, which is what you found out here, T 
200,000 kgs meters per second. Now, conservation of linear momentum requires that the total amount of motion before an impact or before a collision, just before a collision, has to be equal to the total amount of motion just after the collision. So in our case here, before these cars collide, one car was moving at 5 meters per second, the other car was moving at, was not moving, 0 meters per second because they're stationary. So all this motion which you're seeing here, this 200, thousand kgs meters per second is as a result of this first car which has got a huge amount of mass and of course a small amount of velocity the other car as much as it has got mass 3000 kgs meters per second it doesn't have any velocity which has got a velocity of zero so there is no motion coming from the second car are we clear Are we clear on what we are talking about? Yes. What we are talking yes, about here is how much motion is happening. And that amount of motion is measured using a physical quantity called linear momentum. Okay. So, this is how much motion is there just before impact. 200,000 uh, 200, kgs meters per, sec meters per second. Then after impact, we are told that the two cars, they join. So, they, so the mass of the cars basically increases and they move off with the same amount, with the same velocity. So that means that the combined mass of the two cars is going to be M1 plus M2. This M1 plus M2 will have to be multiplied by the velocity of the cars just after impact. And again here, you have to remember that we assume that these objects before they collide or after they collide they move with the same velocity constant velocity there is no acceleration are we clear if there is acceleration then you can't use conservation of linear momentum so in this case the combined masses of the two cars after they collide these freight cars are train cars zambia railway train cars so i'm sure most people have seen what a train looks like Okay, so the combined mass M1 plus M2, that's going to be 40,000 kgs plus uh, 30,000 kgs. That's going to give us a combined mass of 70,000 kgs. So it's a combined mass. This mass multiplied by whatever the volume, whatever the velocity of the cars is after impact, which is V. So this is this 70,000 times V. This is the total linear momentum after impact. Okay. The requirement for conservation of linear momentum is that the total amount of motion just before impact, which is the total linear momentum before impact, has to be equal to the total linear momentum after impact. So this 20,000, this 200,000 kgs meters per second, which is the total linear momentum just before impact, has to be equal to the total linear momentum after impact, which is 70,000 kgs times V. So from this expression, by enforcing this requirement that linear momentum before and after be the same there is no loss of what is there is no loss of what uh energy there can be loss of energy but that's not what you're talking about what we are talking about is momentum i'm not talking about uh, loss of i'm not talking about kinetic energy or like that no usually there is loss of kinetic energy are we clear Yeah, usually there's loss of kinetic energy because if you work out the kinetic energy, if you do a quick calculation using a calculator, for example, if I get my calculator, the total kinetic energy, uh, you have got 40,000 here, which is a mass, you've got 5 meters per second, so kinetic energy is going to be 0 0.5 times 40,000 times mass, uh, the velocity 5 squared, plus this other one, 0 0.5 times... 30, uh, times 30,000 30,000 times the velocity which is 0 squared so the total kinetic energy in this case before impact the total kinetic energy before impact is 500,000 joules okay 
That's the total kinetic energy before impact. That's 500,000 joules. But usually, in many cases, as we are going to see, there is always loss of kinetic energy. In It's very few cases where you don't have loss of kinetic energy. However, what is not lost is linear momentum. The total linear momentum before impact always has to be equal to the total linear momentum after impact. So when you enforce this condition, this requirement, we can work out for V. So in this case, V is going to be, for us to get V, we have to divide by 70,000 kgs on both sides. That's what you do here. V is close to 20, uh, 200,000 kgs meters per second divided by 70,000 like that. And you end up with uh, a velocity which is 2.85 meters per second. So basically, our the velocity of the cars roughly is 2.9 meters per second. You can try to see if the velocity, if the kinetic energy before and after, in this case, after you find this velocity is going to be the same. So 0 0.5 times 70,000 times 2.9 squared. And if you work out the kinetic energy here, you find that the kinetic energy is 294,350. Uh, so basically, kinetic energy has been lost in this case. So this is an example of an event which happens where things collide, then there's loss of kinetic energy. Okay? But what is not lost, what is always conserved is linear momentum. Are we clear? Is that clear to everyone? Yes, what is always conserved is linear momentum. Kinetic energy, total kinetic energy before impact. Yes, sir, it's clear. Total kinetic energy before impact is usually greater than the total kinetic energy after impact, as you as you have seen in this example here. Previously, the total kinetic energy was five thousand uh, five hundred thousand joules. Now, after impact, the total kinetic energy is two hundred and ninety four, three hundred fifty. So you can see that there is a loss in kinetic energy there. Okay. Another example, which is not straightforward, but it is also a collision problem, is one where you would bullets striking on things. Like in this case, example number five. So, uh, a seven gram bullet moving horizontally at 200 meters per second strikes and passes through a 150, K, 150 gram tin can seated on a post just after impact the can has a horizontal speed of 180 of 1.8 meters per second what was the bullet speed after leaving the can so here we've got a small bullet moving at a very high speed so the high speed should contribute to uh what the total linear momentum is supposed to be because momentum as you, we have been saying momentum measures how much motion is happening so you have got the seven gram bullet times uh, multiplied by its velocity so that's going to give us the velocity of the uh, linear momentum of the bullet then you've got a can which has a mass of 150 grams but this can is seated on a post so this can does not have any motion happening with it so we can work out what the total linear momentum is before this bullet strikes the can we are told just after impact the can moves off with a speed of 1.8 so the can after the bullet passes through the can the can gains some motion and the velocity of the can is 1.8 meters per second of course in the direction of the bullet so what we are being asked to find is what is the velocity of the bullet after it leaves the can the velocity of the bullet after it leaves the can if you're talking about conservation of linear momentum is that it's the, the bullet is going to have the same velocity after it leaves the can the velocity of the bullet will not change after it leaves the can. It will always be the same. So we need to find what that velocity is. Are we clear? We need to find what the velocity of the bullet is after it leaves the can. So in this case, we need to find what the total linear... We need to... Do, the, the bullet mass, which is 7 grams, we denote the bullet mass as M1. So M1 is going to be 7 grams... And of course, calculations have to be done in kgs. So this 7 grams needs to be changed into kgs. That's going to be 0 0.007 kgs. Then the velocity of the bullet, uh, U1. So this is the velocity of the bullet before the bullet hits the can. U1, the velocity of the bullet is 200 meters per second. 
Then the mass of the can is M2, which is noted M2, and that is 150, kg, 150 grams. And in kgs, this is going to be 0 0.15 kgs. Then since the can was seated on, a, on an honest post, so its velocity, it wasn't moving, it was at rest. So the velocity of the can, U2, is going to be equals to 0 meters per second. So with this information, with the, we know the mass of the can, we know the mass of the can, the velocity of the can, we know the mass of the bullet, the velocity of the bullet, we can work out what is the total amount of linear momentum before the bullet hits the can. Or basically, what is the total amount of motion which is happening? So that's going to be, that's given by this expression, M1 multiplied by M1, which is the mass of the bullet, multiplied by U1, which is the velocity of the bullet before it hits a can, plus M2, which is the mass of the can, multiplied by uh, U2, which is the velocity of the can before it gets hit by the bullet. The can is a trace, so its velocity is zero. So that's going to be uh, this one here, 0 0.007 kgs, multiplied by the velocity of the bullet, 200 meters, plus uh, 0 0.15 kgs, which is the mass of the can, multiplied by its velocity, which is zero, and this is going to give us a velocity, a total linear momentum, which is equals to 1.4 kgs meters per second. So this is the total amount of motion which is happening. After impact, after the bullet passes through the can, we are told the can moves off with the velocity, the velocity of the can, one point V2 is equals to 1.8 meters per second. And we need to find V1, which is the velocity of the bullet. So... The total linear momentum after impact, that's going to be uh, M1, the mass of the bullet, multiplied by V1, which is the, the velocity of the bullet after it passes through the can, plus M2, which is the mass of the can, plus V2, which is the velocity of the can after it has been hit by the bullet. So that's going to be uh, the mass of the bullet, we assume that the bullet doesn't break up into pieces. It just passes through as a whole. So the mass of the bullet stays the same. 0 0.007 kgs multiplied by V1, which is the velocity of the bullet, plus the mass of the can, which is this one, 0 0.15 kgs multiplied by the velocity of the can, which is 1.8 meters per second. So this whole, when we work out this whole bit here, at the moment, you do not know what V1 is. So you're looking for V1. So this is what we get, 0 0.007 kgs V1 plus 0 0.27 kgs meters per second. This is the total linear momentum after the bullet has hit the can. What we have here is the total linear momentum before the bullet hits the can. Conservation of linear momentum requires that the total linear momentum before impact should be equal to the total linear momentum after impact. That's what conservation requires. So here, basically, it's M1, U1 plus M2, U2 should be equals to M1, V1 plus M2, V2. So basically, this bit here, this is the total linear momentum before impact. This other bit here, this is the total linear momentum after impact. The total linear momentum before impact is 1.4 kgs meters per second. Then this other bit here is the total linear momentum after impact, which is what you have there. So with that, we are looking for V1. We are trying to find out what V1 is. So for us to do that, we can get this bit here, 0 0.27 meters per second, take it to the other side. So we end up having 0 0.007 kgs V1 equals to 1.4 meters per second minus 0 0.27 kgs meters per second. And this side, we end up having 1.13 kgs meters per second. This side. And... This bit here. So we're looking for the V1. So for us to get V1, we have to divide both sides by 0 0.07 kgs. And when you do that, we end up having V1 is close to 1.13 kgs divide meters per second divided by 0 .7, uh, 0.07 kgs, which gives us a velocity of one of 161 meters per second. So you can see here that when the bullet which was fired from the gun, which was traveling at 200 meters per second, passes through this gun, it, re it loses motion. Its velocity reduces from 200 to 116, one meters per second. So basically, that's what happens. Are we clear? Any questions? Yes, we're clear. Okay. Now, let's look for an example 
Yes. Well, yeah, let's look for example number six. Now, example number six uh, basically involves something else. It involves uh, also, apart from conservation of linear momentum, it also involves conservation of kinetic energy. Are we clear? So in example number six, there are two things which are being conserved. There's one, since it's a collision, so it means that there's going to be conservation of linear momentum. And also we are told the, the collision is elastic, perfectly elastic, meaning that there is going to be conservation of kinetic energy. Okay, so what does the question say? Two identical balls collide head on. So if the balls are identical, it means that the masses are the same. Are we clear? If two objects are identical, it means that they were the same mass. So two identical balls collide head on. If the initial velocity of one is 0 0.75 meters east, while that of the other is 0 0.43 meters west. If the collision is perfectly elastic, what is the final velocity of each ball? So in this case, we have got balls, for example, maybe uh, pool table balls, those balls you use for pool. So the, let's assume that that's what you have. They have got the same masses, but they are moving in different directions and they collide. One of them is moving east, the other one is moving west. So there is the idea of this, 0 0.75 meters per second. This is the size of the speed or the velocity. This east tells us the direction. So there is size and the direction in which the ball is moving. So basically what you're talking about here is velocity you also have this one here 0 0.43 meters per second that is the size of the speed or the velocity and there is waste the waste is the direction so basically what we have here are vectors and since we are dealing with vectors we need to choose which direction is going to be positive and which direction is going to be negative because what you're dealing here is east and west so if it's going to the east how do we denote this velocity? If it's going to the waist, how do you denote this velocity? So in this case, basically, the first thing is we realize that these balls are identical. So if the balls are identical, the first ball and the second ball, M1 and M2, the first ball, if we denote it as M1, and the second ball, if we denote it as M2, if they're identical, basically their mass is going to be M. The first ball is moving in the east, and the second ball is moving in the opposite direction, which is west. So we make a choice. You can choose east to be positive and you can choose west to be negative. So if you choose east to be positive, then west, which is the opposite of east, will have to become negative. If you choose west to be positive, then east, which is the opposite of west, will have to become negative. Are we clear? Yes, we're clear. You have to make a choice when it comes to vectors. Okay, so in this example, we choose the eastern direction to be positive. If we choose the eastern direction to be positive, then it means that the west is going to be a negative direction. So the first ball, before they collide, is moving with 0 0.75 meters east. So this, the velocity of the first ball before collision, U1, we write it like this. So it's going to be plus 0 0.75 meters per second. The second ball, is moving in the western direction. Since you have chosen east to be positive, then west will become negative. So the second ball, u2, its velocity of the second ball is going to be u2, and that velocity is going to be minus 0 0.43 meters per second. It's minus because we have chosen east to be positive and west to be negative. So basically, this is what we have. So with this information, we can work out what the total linear momentum is before these balls collide and how do we do that well the total linear momentum before impact is going to be the mass of the first ball multiplied by the velocity of the first ball before impact plus the mass of the second ball plus the velocity of the second ball before impact this one here and that's what we have here however we know that these balls are identical therefore m1 is equals to m2 so you end up having we write m1 as just m and we write m2 as just m like this so at the end of the day the total linear momentum is going to be equals to m then in brackets you have u1 plus u2
Are we clear with this? Are we clear? Yes. Okay. Uh, next. This bit, I think we can omit it for now a bit. Let's ignore the kinetic bit uh, part a bit. We can we come back back late, later. Then after that, we can work out what the total momentum is after impact. So the total momentum after impact, after impact, uh, the first ball is going to have a velocity v1. The second ball is going to have a velocity v2, and also the masses after impact are the same. So the masses are not changing. So even after impact, the total linear momentum after impact is going to be similar to the total linear momentum before impact. It's going to have the same form here, this one. M, since the mass is the same, v, U1 plus U2 inside the brackets. So we're going to have the similar thing after impact. So we're going to have M, which is the mass of the balls, then V1 plus V2 inside the brackets. So that will give us a total linear momentum before after impact now the thing is we do not know what the velocity is or what the velocity of the first ball is after impact we do not know what the velocity of the second ball is after impact so, so there are two things we do not know here we don't know the velocity of the first ball after impact we don't know the velocity of the second ball after impact and of course there is the masses of the balls which do not know which is just m but when we do conservation since uh, we, we, when we enforce conservation of linear momentum, the total linear momentum is conserved. So basically, this means that the total linear momentum before impact and the total linear momentum after impact have to be the same. When you enforce this, we're going to have this. We're going to have m, which is the mass of the balls, multiplied by this, the velocities, the sum of the velocities before impact plus m, which is the mass of the balls, then the velocities after impact like that. When you enforce that, what you're going to end up with is um, here. So this side, you can see there's M this side, there's M that side. So the M's will cancel out. So this M and that M cancel out. When the M's cancel out, we end up with U1 plus U2 equals to V1 plus V2. Now, with this case, the U1 and U2, we know them. V1 and V2 are the ones we don't know. So when you write this, we end up having V1 plus V2 equals to U1 plus U2, and U1 is uh, 0 0.75 meters per second plus U2, which is minus 0 0.75 meters per second. Someone's microphone is on. Taonga Piri, can you switch off your microphone? Downga Piri, switch off your microphone, not just talking nonsense. Piri, can you switch off your microphone? Otherwise, I have to mute you or remove you from the class. Okay. Alright, so in this case, we end up having V1 plus V2 equals to plus 0 0.75 meters per second plus minus 0 point that and we end up having this bit v1 plus v2 is going to be equals to 0 0.32 meters per second this is what you have here now this is not the answer to our problem because in this case we still do not know what v1 and v2 are okay so that's what we can do with conservation of linear momentum we can come up with this nice expression here v1 plus v2 is equals to 0 0.32 meters per second but this expression doesn't give us the answer to what is the velocity of the balls after impact for us to do that we need to since we are told that the collision is perfectly elastic we need to also employ the requirement that the this collision is elastic meaning that there is conservation of kinetic energy for us to work out the kinetic energy of course we need to know the masses of the balls m1 and m2 and also their velocities u1 and u2 so in that case the total kinetic energy before these balls collide is going to be equals to now 
in the case of kinetic energy when you're working out kinetic energy direction really doesn't matter whether you choose what you have to, the, the direction you chose is negative you choose is to be negative you choose uh ways to be positive it doesn't really matter because you're going to square are we clear this bit u1 squared u2 squared so whichever one is negative is still going to be squared is that clear yes kinetic energy does not have direction kinetic energy yes, is energy it's not a vector yes what's the question are we clear so in this case the total kinetic energy before the balls collide is going to be equal to half the mass of the first ball which is m1 multiplied by the velocity of the first ball which is u1 squared plus the mass of the uh, half the mass of the second ball m2 multiplied by the velocity of the second ball before they collide which is u2 squared similarly we can also do the same thing after yeah so here so which is what you have here this part here but we are told that the balls are identical which means that m1 is equal to m2 so this ex expression which you have here this one which is the total kinetic energy before collision in this case because the balls are identical m1 is equals to m2 so we end up having this expression equals to half m u1 squared plus u2 squared so this is the total kinetic energy before the balls collide this expression here half m u1 squared plus u2 squared that's what gives you the total kinetic energy before so this expression is the total kinetic energy before the balls collide we can come up with a similar expression after the balls have collided so immediately after the balls collide the expression for kinetic energy is this one half m1 v1 squared plus half m2 v2 squared so in that similar case, we end up with this. This is the total kinetic energy after the balls collide. And since the balls are identical, M1 is equal to M2. So we end up with the total kinetic energy after collision being given by this. Half M V1 squared plus V2 squared. So this is the total the expression for the kinetic energy after the balls collide. So with that being the case, if we say that the collision is elastic, perfectly elastic, it means that the total kinetic energy before collision and after collision are the same. So these expressions of kinetic energy before impact and after impact should be the same. So the total kinetic energy before impact has to be made equal to the total kinetic energy after impact, which is what we have here in this expression here. However, if you look at this expression, there's a half M and half M this side. So the half M, we cancel out half M on both sides. If you cancel out half M, you remain with this. You remain with U1 squared plus U2 squared which is equals to v1 squared plus v2 squared like this again this bits the v2 v1 squared plus v2 squared we do not know what v1 is we do not know what v2 is but we know what u1 is and you know what u2 is so u1 squared plus u2 squared that bit we know so we end up we write this thing as v1 squared plus u2 squared is going to be equals to here in this expression u1 we know u1 since we chose east to be positive, it's going to be plus 0 0.75 meters squared plus U2, the velocity of the second ball. It's moving west, so that was chosen to be negative, so it's going to be minus 0 0.45 meters per second squared, like that, meters, that, then you square it, and when you do that, you end up with this expression. You end up with V1 squared plus V2 squared is equal to 0 0.7575 meters squared second squared. So you end up with this nice expression here. V1 squared plus U2 squared is equal to 0 0.7575 meters squared. We also have an expression up here, which you found here. V1 plus V2 is equal to 0 0.3, uh, 0 0.32 meters per second squared. So when you drop your units for the first expression, you end up having V1 plus V2 is equal to 0 0.3. 32. This other down expression here, when you drop these units, you end up having v1 squared plus v2 squared is equal to 0 0.757474 like that now with these two expressions we have got two equations with two unknowns v1 plus v2 equals to 0 0.32 then you've got v1 squared plus v2 squared equals to 0 0.7575 so we've got two equations 
which I've got two unknowns. So these equations can be solved simultaneously, of course, by substituting. So from the first, from this expression here, v1 plus v2 equals to 0 0.32, we can decide to make v2 the subject of the formula. So we take this bit, the other side, so we end up having v2 is equals to 0 0.32 minus v1. This, so we end up with this. The reason why we are doing this is because we want to substitute this v2 here. We want to substitute it here so that we can square it. So when you do that, so we end up with, uh, when you do that substitution, so we want to substitute the v, v2 here, we end up with v1 squared is equal to open bracket 0 0.32 minus v1, the whole thing squared equals to 0 0.7474. So this bit, when you expand it, you end up having this, that, and that, this bit here. So when you do the whole expansion, you will end up with this expression, v1 squared plus 0 0.32 squared minus this bit, 0 0.32 v1 minus 0 0.32 v1 plus this bit equals to this whole thing here. And of course, when you simplify this thing, you end up with 2 v1 squared minus 0 0.34 v1 minus 0 0.645 equals to 0. Now you notice that this is, this has got v1 here there's v1 here there's no v1 on this side then this v1 here is squared and here it's not squared and there's nothing there so basically what you have here this 2 v1 squared minus 0 0.64 v1 minus 0 0.645 equals to 0 basically it looks like this ax squared plus bx plus c is equals to 0 in this case our a is the 2, our x is the v1, then our b is this bit here, minus 0 0.64, then our x is the v1, then of course, plus our c is this bit here. So basically what we have here is a quadratic equation. And if you've got a quadratic equation, are we clear with the quadratic bit? Yes, so we have a quadratic equation. If you get a quadratic equation, you can solve a quadratic equation using a quadratic formula. One way of solving quadratic equations, there are many other ways of doing it, but the simplest way is to use the quadratic formula, which is this one. X is equal to minus B plus or minus square root of B, B squared minus 4A, 4AX over 2A. So in this case, our, our X is our V1. Our A is 2. Our B is is minus 0 0.4 uh, 0, 0 point, uh, minus 0 0.64 our c is minus 0 0.645 so when you substitute all these values in this quadratic expression like i have done here you end up with something which looks like this v1 is equals to 0 0.64 plus or minus 2.36 so there's a plus or minus there so we end up with that divided by four so this whole thing if you work it out so you end up with this v1 so you're going to have two values of v1 v1 is going to be 0 0.64 plus 2.36 uh divided by four or v1 is equals to 0 0.64 minus that and you end up having v1 is equals to 0 0.65 uh, 0 0.75 or v1 is equals to minus 0 0.43 so we have got two values of velocity for v1 which is the first object which is moving in the eastern direction that's what v1 is doing the first mass is moving east the first identical ball is moving east so what you are being told here is that v1 is the two values of velocity v1 is 0 0.75 meters per second and v1 is minus 0 0.43 if you look at the initial velocity of the balls, V1 had a velocity of 0 0.75 meters per second east. You've seen that? It was moving east. The first solution, V1 equals to 0 0.75 meters per second, is telling you that, oh, these balls collided, but somehow the first ball continued moving east because this is a positive value of velocity. 
Somehow, the first ball passed through the second ball, collided with the second ball, it passed through the second ball, and it continued moving east as if nothing had happened. Is that clear? Is my explanation clear on what V1 is? V1 equals to 0.75 meters per second. We have chosen east to be positive. So this velocity, this value of V1, 0.75, is telling us the first ball collided with the second ball and it passed through as if the second ball was not there and its velocity did not change. Now, we know that this is physically impossible unless you are lucky or something like that. Or these Marvel superhero things where you can pass through them, then nothing happens. So the first solution, V1 equals to 0 0.75, is not possible. Are we clear? Mathematically, it's not, it's correct, but physically, it's not possible. One ball cannot collide with another ball, then its velocity doesn't change, and it just, as if it passes through and nothing happens. However, the second, the second solution, V1, which is equals to minus 0 0.43 meters per second, is telling us something. The second solution, minus 0 0.43, says that the first ball collided with the second ball and bounced back. So the first ball bounces back, it starts moving westwards, and the velocity it has is 0 0.43 meters per second. This is, more, this is what makes sense. Because if you're going to collide with something, then you don't move, you don't pass through this something, you have to bounce. So the negative is telling us that there's a bounce. But apart from the bounce, the fact that these things have got identical mass means that the other ball starts moving westwards with the velocity of the first ball. So basically, these two identical balls exchange velocities. This minus 0 0.43, minus 0 0.43 meters per second is the velocity of the first ball, of the second ball, which is moving west. Here. The velocity of the first ball, which is moving west. Here. U2 minus 0 0.43 meters per second so this problem is telling us that if you have got two identical balls which are going to collide elastically one thing which is going to happen is that they are going to exchange velocities are we clear yes clear. they will exchange velocities because the first ball cannot just pass through the second ball as if nothing is, has happened because these balls have to collide. So because the collision is elastic, they will exchange velocities. So the velocity of the second ball after collision will become the velocity of the first ball. Now, if this is the velocity of the first ball, if V1 is equal to, so this is what we accept. If V1 is equal to minus 0 0.43 meters per second, then we can go ahead and find what the velocity of the second ball is. Remember, we had this expression v2 is equals to 0 0.32 minus v1 since v1 is minus 0 0.43 that's what you found here v1 as minus 0 0.43 then when we substitute here we're going to end up having v2 is going to be equal to 0 0.32 minus minus 0 0.43 and that's going to give us v2 which is equals to 0 0.75 so we end up having v2 which is equals to 0 0.75 meters per second this this is showing you that the second ball, which was moving west, will now move east. But when it moves east, it's going to be moving with the velocity of the first ball before they collided. So basically, these two balls, which are identical, when they bounce off each other, they will exchange velocities. Are we clear? Yeah, so basically that's what's going to ha that's what happens in elastic collisions, especially in the case where you've got masses of identical mass, uh, objects of identical mass colliding in an elastic collision. Basically, there's going to be an exchange of velocities. So this is what you 
this is what comes out from enforcing conservation of linear momentum and also from enforcing conservation of kinetic energy in a collision. Any questions? We have to stop here. Is there any question? Okay, so if there is no question, we'll stop here. We will finish up this whole thing on, on, on Thursday, Thursday morning. So this week will be done with conservation. Uh, so yes. I have a question. Are we only going to look at uh, momentum in two dimensions or we are also going to look at momentum in three dimensions? The maximum we're going to look at momentum is in two dimensions. Um, I, I don't think I've got a two-dimensional examples, but basically I think I've explained about two-dimensional momentum. Just a bit. I think I've done this where I showed you that say if you would go into two-dimensional momentum, then uh, where is that? Where, where, where? You have to work out momentum. Uh, where, where, where is that? Like this. This is two-dimensional momentum. Yes, so if it's in two dimensions, basically it means that you are going to have two equations of momentum. One for momentum along the x-direction. This one, you have to do this. Then the other one, you have to do this. Momentum, conservation in the y-direction. Then after that, if you are very unlucky that it's, there, there's, cons there's conservation, it's an elastic collision, then you also have to use another thing for conservation of kinetic energy. But usually that's too complicated. Okay. So for two-dimensional momentum, you have to do this. You have to find out what is the velocity along the x-direction before collision along the y-direction and enforce these equations. For now, in class, most likely in your tutorial sessions, you have to, yeah, there's a problem on two-dimensional momentum. But in these examples here, I'm only looking at how to enforce momentum conservation along a line in one dimension and also how to enforce uh, conservation of kinetic energy in one direction. So basically, that's it. That's what I'm looking at. But you can extend right, this thing so. to two dimensions. So you have to do this momentum thing along the x-direction and the momentum thing along the y-direction. We know how to find the components of the velocities. What is the velocity along the y-direction? What's the velocity yes, along the x-direction? We know how to do that. Okay. So I don't have such examples on, in, in two-dimensional momentum. I don't have them. I only have uh, one-dimensional examples. Any other question? I was still going to be following the same uh, timetable that you had. Yes, 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 yes. Yes. So for you guys, uh, I meet you on Monday and Thursday morning at eight hours. So that's what we're going to follow the rest of the year. Any other question? Okay, so if there are no questions, uh, we will meet on Thursday, Thursday morning, eight hours. I know it's very cold, but we have to wake up. Okay. And please, uh, Take very good care of yourselves. I think you're watching the TVs and the news and Facebook. We have COVID all over the place. It's everywhere. So you are just lucky that when you left this place, that's when the COVID really, really started. That's when it made landfall. So wherever you are, please look after yourselves very carefully. Wear a mask all the time. Do not move unnecessarily. Okay. So see you on on. Thursday morning. The recording will be uploaded to YouTube. So for those people who have not who didn't make the class, they can watch it later on. Okay. <laughs>